All right, welcome back to everyone, for everyone that has gotten to come here and be out. We're uh, a, a member or two light, but we are still going strong. Brother uh, Ken and uh, his friend are headed to the heart of the South, I guess, and uh, we'll, they will be missed, but we will carry on. Does anybody remember, other obviously than chapter and verse, what we looked at in our previous uh, meeting? Brother Larry, you're the only one I saw because my head's down, so somebody else put their hand up first. Okay. Would you care to elaborate? Uh, one said the Holy One. That's what I remember most. It was written down and talked about. Yes. Vine Holy One. Verse 10. Not seeing corruption. Not seeing corruption. Yes. Jarrett, did you have something that you wanted to add? That's just the way. That's, and as the years go by, he'll do that more and more. Um, <laughs> um we also uh, we also talked about uh, God's preservation, and um, we talked about the uh, mictum of the Psalm of David, the the golden secret or the secret, uh, or uh, I think it also can just mean poem. We also well talked a little bit about the meter, if you will, of this uh, of this particular psalm that it may not have actually been a song per se, as much as it may have been a thing. And then we did a lot of uh, a lot of comparisons uh, with Brother Kenny, uh, as you recall. Um, anybody else? Well, that will lead us to where we're at today in uh, Psalm chapter 17, as we continue on our, on our quest to complete the Psalms. Uh, at least three and a half year journey. <laughs> um, this is titled, at least in my Bible, as a prayer of David. This is um, all of these psalms were written out and were publicized and were very common among the Israelites of that era. Um, this does not like the previous psalm we read like up, up until 15 all the psalms that we read had a very clear musical lilt to them they they started low and they rose to a crescendo in which god was ultimately uplifted chapter 16 was more of a poem that was that uh was designed to not only um teach us, but also to reveal some hidden truths about who, who David's ultimate offspring would be and how that would eventually lead to that man being uh, the king of kings. Chapter 17 does read like a prayer. It does not necessarily read, or, or, or a poem, it doesn't necessarily read like a song, like it, like it has that that low to rise, or even, or even a, a chorus-like effect, where you have a chorus and then you go, rise to a chorus and then down to a verse and back to a chorus. It doesn't even have that. It does. It does read fairly linear, linearly, and also is not um, is not incredibly complex. This this psalm is definitely it, it. It is it is the type of thing that if I was to write some kind of verse, which obviously I'm not inspired to do so, but if I was to write some type of verse on how my walk in relationship with the Lord was, what I would come up with would be very simple, would be very, would be very, very non-complex. And, and this loses some of the complexity that we've seen that comes from songs. If you, if you ever sing a, a song or a hymn, um, you'll notice that at times, if, if you take time to look at the lyrics that you're singing, there's, there's a wealth of depth in those things. And I think you see that in a lot of these other psalms. This one, I'm not saying that there's no depth here, but this, the, the, the beauty of Psalm 17 is in its simplicity, in, is, in, is in its straightforward message uh, uh, to us. And, and that, can be, that can be as valuable, if not more valuable. Uh, and, and when something, especially something in the Scripture, is presented as a, as a simple truth, like salvation, 
there's often layers of complexity in behind it as well. Uh, so there, there's always more that we can dig from it. But I, I, I think this one, it, it, this one, this psalm, I will just say at least for, my, for myself, was very digestible. Mm-hmm. It was, it was, it was, it was in, and that. Uh, that was just my experience with it, and we'll we'll get to it as we as we read on. So Psalm, Psalms chapter seventeen in the first verse: Hear the right, O Lord, attend unto my cry, give ear unto my prayer that goeth not out of feigned lips. Let my sentence come from, forth from thy presence. Let thine eyes behold the things that are equal. Thou hast proved mine heart. Thou hast visited me in the night. Thou hast tried me. And shall uh, find nothing. I am purposed that my tr- mouth shall not transgress. The first three verses are a a key outcry to the Lord. the 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 first verse is he want he he is calling upon the Lord to hear what he has to say to to uh, to bend an ear to a child. Now we talked very very lengthily about the relationship between a servant and a king. And when a servant comes before their Lord, when a servant comes before their master, when we go before our God, if we're in the right state, if we're not in abject rebellion, it is his duty to hear us. And and, and that, that seems like, well, you can't control God. And I said, that's, not, that's, not what I'm, that's, not, that's not what I'm saying. God's contractual arc, uh, agreement with us, that is, if we're serving him, he will be there. So David is calling upon this and saying, Lord, I'm asking for something here, and I need you to hear me. And he goes even a step further, and he says he wants him to hear a prayer that's not out of feigned lips, or it, it means that not lying. I'm not going to, I'm not, I'm, uh, lips that haven't, that aren't coming from a place of, of a falsehood. Now, what could this what could this mean? So, I mean, I, it, David lied in his kingship. Uh, a lot of the stuff around uh, killing uh, Uriah the Hittite was uh, was was fairly de- deceptive. Um, what I think he means coming from here is that David is trying to come from a place of open honesty about who he is and where his state is at. In fact, he calls upon the Lord to try him in the preceding verses. Now, when we come before God, a lot of the time, I think we do come with feigned lips. We come before God requesting something, which it's not wrong to request something of God. That is, as him as our our Lord, as our King, and as our Father, when my children come come to me with a request, it is my duty as a loving father to seek to fulfill that request if it's within my power, and it is it, it is it is by my design it, it, that it's going to fit in with the thing. I don't just give my kids whatever they want. Why? Because a good father doesn't do that. If it, it, a a good father shows limitations, and our Lord does too, but we come most often or not just like sometimes my children come to me. They've been awful all day, and now I want, and now they want ice cream, or they want. A coat. It's like you're the same child that was that was pitching a fit not 30 minutes ago, right? And now we're now we're talking about treats and rewards, and we come before God so often with a request. Somebody's ill. Somebody's sick. Something awful is happening in our life. Financial trouble, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Political trouble. Whatever you want to throw, whatever you want to throw on the the prayer pyre, which those are usually the common human. Uh, concerns that we have. We rarely dip into our spiritual problems. Um, But we come at those from a place of maybe we're at fault. Maybe we're distant. Maybe maybe we are coming to the Lord out of obligation. Brother Larry says, y'all need to pray about this this week. And, And we're just praying out of obligation because somebody asked us to pray for him. Well, is that not a false state to be in? A place where in the Lord is not going to hear that cry. It's very similar to when um, David numbered the people in Samuel. And then he cries to God and asks him, why is all this happening? And the Lord's like, well, we told you not to do this. Now the death angel is just going and he's slaying people. 
we come before God and we ask Him, but we have so much... To, we're, we're not coming to Him as David is here with this open heart policy, if you will. Now the Lord knows the thoughts and the intents of your heart, whether you're trying to be closed in about it or not. But this attitude is presentative of a person that doesn't have anything to hide, that is fully prepared to, um, to have their request met, that is not coming to God just out of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Not obligation necessarily, but the, um, for personal gain, for fleshly gain, if you will. This is, David says, Let thy sentence come forth from thy presence. Let thine eyes behold the things that are equal. David wanted his actions and the things that was in his heart. And we, you know, a lot of religions talk about counterbalancing. Even the ancient Egyptians believed in, at the end of life, that they would put a feather of truth on one side and your actions on another, and if those things weigh back out, then you went into the Egyptian afterlife. This idea of will my good deeds and bad deeds outweigh each other goes back for thousands of years, and some religions are literally built on them. This idea that I can do good. But David, as someone who was a servant of God, does ask, it's like, I I'm, I'm going to ask you for something, but while I'm asking, I want you to check up on me, and I want you to see what state I'm in. And I want to let you know that I'm serious about, this, about what I'm fixing to talk about because I've gotten as close to you as I can get to you. He actually wanted God to weigh, see that all things are equal. And then he goes on, uh, Thou hast proved mine heart, thou hast visited me tonight, thou hast tried me, and shalt find nothing. David was so sure, was so sure of his spiritual standpoint that he says, you're going to try me and you're not going to find anything. You're not going to find anything wrong with my service because I've been doing everything I can do. Now that's someone who's coming before God in a serious nature that has gotten all their house laid out in order ahead of God. Now, is that how we come to prayer most of the time? No. Rarely, if ever. I know I bow my head over at least three meals a day, and I doubt that I come to all those blessings fully prepped the way David is here. And I say, well, that's just you know, blessing over your food. That's, it's, it's, it's prayer. But even on a more serious note, when you enter your prayer closet and you have those private prayers and those private times at home with the Lord, are we visiting God with this level of preparation? Rarely, if ever. I'd say, I'd, I'd say the, the, the most time when we get in, in this situation is when we have calamity strike us and we're forced to get ourselves right so that we can actually have contact with God. And it's hard, and it's, and, and it's bitter, but it's not the time that we should be doing that. How much time could we save if we were already connected? If you could just, like David says, hear the right, O Lord, attend unto my cry. And, and you have God's attention. He's, he, he's attentive, and he's waiting to hear what your request is. Concerning the works of men, uh, by uh, this verse 4, concerning the works of men, by the word of thy lips, I have kept me from the paths of the destroyer. David is outlining again, I'm not walking out in the ways of the world. I'm, I, I'm, I'm serving to my, to my utmost. Hold up my goings in thy paths, that my footsteps slip not. I have called upon thee, for thou wilt hear me, O God. Incline thy ear unto me, and hear my speech. Now his first request in this, and this is a, a request that we, especially, especially when times of calamity come, this is a request that we never make. It's for his spiritual well-being. He, sa he says in verse 5, Hold up my, foot, my, my goings in thy paths, that my footsteps slip not. Was he talking about, well, I'm going on a long journey, so I don't want to slip off the side of a mountain. No, this has nothing to do with the physical. He is wanting to walk on God's path, and his, his first request in this prayer is that I am walking your path. I want you to assist me and keep me on that path. His first request isn't, now I would like a brand new Lamborghini. I, my, I, his first request is now, I, 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 would, I, don't, I, I would like a million dollars in the bank account. I would like uh, all my ills and diseases healed, please. His first and his major thought is for his spiritual well-being. 
He says, I have attained, and, and I'm not talking about spiritual perfection here, but David had attained a level that we rarely see among God's people these days, and that is at peace and harmony with God. Walking his path and God walking beside of him. And all he was asking for in the first part of this prayer is that God would reach out his hand and hold his and make sure that he didn't slip off that path. That he would be able to continue in this light. Because he wanted to maintain this connection. The Bible says that David was a man after God's own heart. And and, and I don't believe that makes him better or more perfect. But David had a sincere desire to walk close to the Lord. He was like Enoch in that, in, 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 in that manner where Enoch walked with God and was not, for God took him. This is the type of prayer that we have to pray if we want to attain that level of, of spiritual closeness and, and this type of prayer that we can, we can come before the Lord, we can ask Him, and He just takes care of it. And we can trust that He'll just take care of it. Because he always has before. He does with our with our never dying souls. I have called upon thee, for thou wilt hear me, O God. Incline thine ear unto me, hear my speech. Shew thy mar- marvelous loving kindness, O thou that savest by thy right hand, them which put their trust in thee from those that rise up against them. Now he starts talking about physical threats. He wants the Lord to, well, I mean, it's literally in the song, hold me fast, let me stand in the hollow of thy hand, keep me safe till the storm passes by. Uh, not inspired scripture there, but that is the lilt of this, of, of this verse of the psalm here, is that he literally wanted them to take him in his right hand and protect not just himself, who he says, uh, who said, uh, 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 them which put their trust in thee. David was not only requesting prayer and protection for himself from physical outside threats. He was requesting help for all those that walked in it. And, and I, I always am, always, uh, whenever we have prayer, uh, Brother Eric always requests prayer for the true missionaries. That's this type of prayer. Right. For those that are trusting you, and me as well, <laughs> Hold, put me in, in, in safety. For all, uh, f- from those that rise up against them. Now, this can be physical, physical outside threat. This can be, this can be, like bodily harm. This can go as far as just a good tongue lashing from somebody. Uh, you know, oppressive coworkers, uh, the uh, uh, family members who just don't seem to see it your way. Um, just the the. Any type of outside threat like that where they're coming against the people of God and you're trying to live right and you don't have a solid defense against them, there's someone who does. You simply but need to hold up your shield of faith, trust God to to have your back, if you will, and let the arrows fly. They'll all bounce off. Because you have requested help, and more importantly, I think this is where we fall off most of the time. You have faith that that help is going to do what you've requested it to do. Faith is a grain of mustard seed. The Bible says can move, can cause mountains to move out of our way, and and I think that's both a spiritual and a physical possibility. Faith has done. Great, great things, uh, brother Junior. In his in his lesson today, when he was talking about the woman, his thy faith has healed thee. And it's a very interesting thing. The Lord knew she needed help. He came by that way with a purpose. This is just like salvation. He came, brother Larry. When you were lost, he came by your way with a purpose, and you had faith, and he had the power to turn that faith into something real. To spark it alive. We can trust Him with the stuff in here. We can trust Him with our soul. Something that will outlast everything you see around around you and everyone you see around you. But we do not often have the faith to just sit in the right hand of God and let Him be a protecting element for us. For Him to to sweep aside all those that assail us. 
And is it going to be easy? No. Faith is rarely easy. You think it was easy for Peter to step out the side of a boat into a raging storm in the middle of the sea? No, but I think in the moments in which he walked to Jesus, he believed wholeheartedly that Jesus would keep him above the waves. What was Peter's failure when he took his eyes off the master and saw the winds and boisterous and the waves, a white capping, and he began to sink? Faith can do some marvelous things. Keep me as the apple of thy eye, hide me under the shadow of thy wings, from the wicked that oppress me, from my deadly enemies who can pass me about. Keep me as the apple of the, uh, of the eye. It, the apple of your eye is often, a, especially in our modern era, is an, is, an endear, is an endearing term of a significant other. Well, that person is the apple of my eye. What does that mean? That means they hold all of your love, at least in our physical body, they hold all of your love and your care and your emotion is centered and rests upon them. And what David was requesting here is that God would have those, those same emotions of care and love and protection over him. And then he goes even further and says, under the shadow of thy wings. Now, and here he's invoking the very idea of a mother hen. When there is calamity a, uh, or a storm coming, a mother hen will gather her chicks and she'll spread, she'll get in the nest and they'll all crawl up underneath her where it's nice and warm and safe and she'll spread them wings around her and she will get wet, she will get beat, and she sometimes will die to protect those chicks. Why do, why do chickens squawk and peck at you when you're reaching underneath there to get, get their eggs? You're, you're taking their babies. This is my baby. And David is invoking that in God. He says, not that God will die, but he says, you will take all the beating. You will take all the suffering. Any, any of this ringing a bell? You will take all of the pain and terror, and under you I'll be protected. He literally did that. He literally took all the beating, all the pain, all the suffering, and then he died. But on that third day, he came back, and all of us little chicks, if you will, were safe and warm and cared for. Why? Because someone else saw fit to take all the punishment for us. And David is invoking, they say, I want that level of love and protection around me at all times. And we can have that. That glow, I, I, I only describe it as a glow or an uplifting, a swelling, if you will. When you're saved, we can maintain that. We don't, but we can maintain that. Where does that come from? That comes from joy in having Christ in our life. And we become immune and callous to it and we let other things draw our attention away. You know, sometimes when a, a storm is coming, the mother hen can't get all of her chicks. They'll go and do their own thing sometime and can't get back to the nest. And you know what? A lot of times those chicks die. Right. We can have the warmth and safety and comfort and protection of Christ at all times if we would just step a little closer. That just saved feeling, if that's what we want to call it, that is maintainable. The joy of that moment can be rehad again and again and again. But what does it require? It requires the Holy Spirit to be inside of us. And what is that going to require? Well, the Holy Spirit can go and come as He wishes. That doesn't make us any less or, or more saved. But He is not going to stand around if you're just going to be wicked. Why would He? That's like if we took this church building and we just started painting satanic symbols all over the inside of it. I doubt any of us would want to meet here. And just in the same way, our bodies are a temple. The New Testament says this. Our body is a temple of the Holy Ghost. Therefore, glorify your body. So we're supposed to live this life like Christ. Why? So that Christ can live inside of us. And we can get that just saved feeling, if you will, all the time. That protection and love and care. This is what he was requesting here. They that are enclosed uh, in their own fat, with their mouth uh, they speak um, 
Uh, th- this is continued to talk about the wicked in verse 9. They are enclosed in their own fat. With their mouth they speak proudly. They have now compassed us in our steps. They have set their eyes bowing down to the earth. Like, like as a lion that is greedy of his prey, and as it were a young lion lurking in secret places. Now David describes this enemy and he uses the lion. Who else has been described as a lion in the scriptures? The devil himself. A young lion that's greedy for his prey, lurking. You know, a, 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 a lion is a very, very powerful beast, but a young lion does not have the full strength. So all, all big cats do this. They will stalk their prey. If you've ever seen even a regular house cat, they, if they see a bug or something, what do they do? They get down and they get on them haunches and they, they'll come forward a little bit and they'll stop and they'll stare and they'll move forward a little bit and eventually they'll reach out and they'll grab it. That's what cats do. Now a lion does not have to be as stealthy as that. If you've ever seen any wildlife videos on Discovery Channel or something, a lion will lay in full view of a herd of wildebeest because he doesn't care. He's the king of the beast on that field. And he'll take whoever he wants to take. The Bible says of the devil that he walketh about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. The devil is the king of the beast. So who is this young lion? I think these are all the outside woes that are influenced by the devil. The children of the devil, if you will. And they can't come right at you the way the devil can. Because the devil, despite him not being as powerful as God, he is more powerful than you. By far. Without God, you are nothing but a road bump on his, on, on his, on his trip to destruction. So, but the children of the devil, they have to be crafty. They have to be sneaky. And pro- maybe it's a friend or a family member or a co-worker, or, or, or it can not be a person, it can be a thing, television, or, or uh, a job, or any other things. They worm your way, their way into your life. And be, you, don't, you never see them coming, you never think about them being there. One minute you look over your shoulder and they're crouched up, and, oh, that's where he's at. You turn your head away and when you turn back, he's on you. Talk about the hens and chicks again. If a chick is away from its mother, it is very vulnerable to hawks. We, me and Papa were talking about some of his chickens getting neat. Uh, uh, bald eagles, uh, uh, barn owls, raccoons, um, uh, coyotes, if they can get up in them. That all these animals will attack and kill a chick. Uh, cats will, big cats will do it too. And a lot of time, where do they come? In the cover of dark. Where there's no protection, there's no, there's, no, there's no humans around to get them. And the chickens, they'll squawk and they'll, and, and, and they'll do what they do, but there's just nothing they can do about it. One of their own is now gone. And that's how these young lions come at us. Before we'll, we'll turn around and there'll be a weak member of the church and maybe we don't bolster them, maybe we don't reinforce them, or maybe weak member of the church, if that's you, maybe you didn't let us know in time. You know, the, when we have... When we have church services upstairs and we have those, the closing hymn and the opportunity to come before the church, that is a time that when, if you're in a moment of weakness, we're not mind readers. <laughs> we don't have the ability just to see into your heart and know what your spiritual state is. That's your opportunity. But maybe that person hasn't come and we'll turn away and we'll look and then that member's just gone. And how did it happen? One of these young lions, greedy for their service and for their and for their lives has taken them away. And, and 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 sometimes they never make their way back. Sometimes they're devoured by that young lion. Arise, O Lord, disappoint him, cast him down, deliver my soul from the wicked, which is thy sword. From men which are thy hand, O Lord, from men of the world which have their portion in this life, whose belly thou fillest with thy hidden treasure, they are full of children and leave the rest of their substance to their babes. Who is he specifically calling out? He says, of all of this trouble, deliver me. Cast, me, cast them down with, their, with, he said, with thy sword. What is compared to the sword in the scripture? 
word is like a powerful two-edged sword piercing under the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. But this is it. You want a weapon with which to fight, begin to study. Begin to learn. And I'm not saying whenever somebody comes at you, I mean, I guess you could, uh, just to start throwing verses at them. But in here we find, we find inner strength and inner peace and, and knowledge. When we see a situation on the horizon, I think I'm just going to steer clear of that. Because the Bible says that these are that, that some of the warning signs I'm seeing around this situation, that they lead to something far worse than even what the warning signs are telling us about. It's a very, very, uh, very good thing. And, and, and who, are, who are the people? It's men. It's, all, it's, always, it's always people that destroy our lives. And, and a very specific type of person. P- people who live for this life and then die. At, men of the world which have their portion in this life. This is all they'll ever have. And unfortunately, separate and apart the Lord doing something in their life, they will find their eternal reward and there's no gain there. So they will drag as many of us down with them as they can. Now, can you lose your salvation from one? I don't believe in in loss of salvation, but they can sure wreck your life. As for me, and, and he talks about their sustenance and what they have in verse 14, what their life is about. And in verse 15 it says, As for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I will be satisfied when I wake with thy likeness. Now what does this mean? He says, of all the things that they get in their life and all the things that could beset us in our own, I, and this is speaking of David, and if you can say it with it, praise be, because this is a very good place to be. I will behold thy face in righteousness, which means he's, he's attained a closeness to God. This could even be talking about eternal reward, because beholding the face of God is something that no one has ever done. No one. Moses got close, and he just saw the hinder parts of God, and it made him glow for the rest of his days. So nobody's seen the face of God and lived. So this could be talking about our eternal reward. It said, I, and I shall be satisfied when I wake with what? With thy likeness. I think this is actually specifically talking about Christianity. Christianity means to be Christ-like, and if you're waking with thy likeness, when you, if you can look in the mirror, and it's hard, to live like this, but if you can look in the mirror and say, I did everything I could to try to be like Christ today, that's a joy and that's a victory. You gained something that day. And, and did you do it perfectly? No, because you'd have been out of here. Uh, sin, sinless perfection is not attainable because we still have this to deal with. At the very, li- at the very least, you may have driven by a McDonald's and said, boy, I'd love a cheeseburger. And that may not sound like much, but that's, that's the flesh lusting for a cheeseburger. <laughs> and you fail there. But it's the goal. It's, it's, try, it, it's being able to look at yourself and say, can I open my, ask God to look in my life to weigh the balances and find them equal? Did I do enough today to be like Christ? And will I be able to do enough tomorrow to do it? That's how we maintain that just saved feeling. That's how that close walk with God, it's hard to maintain. I know. We all struggle with it, and it's not going to get any easier. In fact, probably the older you get, the harder it's going to be. But there is encouragement, especially especially if the first part of verse 10 is that I will behold thy face in righteousness. If you're saved, you've got a very, very special thing that nobody else on the planet's got, and that is the blood of Jesus Christ sanctifying you every single day, making you at least in God's eyes, he can look down and say, he's, he's perfect because my son was perfect and my son's blood is marking him as one of my own. And I, and I can't say a thing about the awful things that he did today. Now, does that mean we should go and live like a dog? No, I think this chapter is very clear that we should try to live like Christ. You know, if somebody killed themselves in protection of you, maybe took a bullet for you, let's talk about a fleshly thing, if they survived, you would try to help them for the rest of the day. They may be even be your best friend for the rest of your days. Or if they passed, you would try to make atonement with their family. Why? Because you feel guilt 
because it is the right thing to do. You know what? Jesus gave his life for us. And it is our duty to atone for that, to try every day to live up to the example that he left because he left the ultimate example. To be willing to go so far as to lay lay down your life for a friend. How bizarre to be able to call the Lord God of heaven a friend. Any questions or comments about Psalm 17? Brother Jared, I can see you chomping at the bit. Go ahead. I'm reminded of two things. You talk about the joy of just being saved. I'm reminded of Psalm 51 when David was repenting of his sin with Bathsheba. One of the pleas was, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Right. Right. And then I was thinking, um, when it says, When I wake with thy likeness, uh, John speaking of the catching away says, We shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. Very true. Very true. Yes. Right. Because yeah, you never lost it to begin with. Well, and, and, and the blessing of that verse is, it says that the joy of your salvation can be restored. The point is... That joy when you felt when you were first saved, you can get that back. Anytime that you're willing to do the work to make it happen. And there, there, my friends, is the rub. We do not want to do the work. <laughs> it's a lot of effort. Being close to God is a very denial of yourself. I'm talking about the hens and the chicks. If you ever watch, especially ducks, but I think chickens will do this too. They all follow in line behind mama. Especially ducks. And that requires a level of uniformity and attention to what mama is doing. And if we want to be close to God, we're going to have to walk like him. We're going to have to quack like him. We're going to have to swim like him. And ultimately, we're going to have to fly like him. Because... If we don't, we're the baby duck out there by itself and some big old snake or something's going to come along and that's going to be the end of that. Any other questions, comments, concerns? Well, y'all didn't throw a tomato at me this week, so maybe we'll try next week to get a rise out of you. Psalm 18, I was noticing, is incredibly long. Uh, We may divide Psalm 18 into two separate or maybe even three separate parts uh, because it is 50 verses. I I doubt y'all have four or five hours to sit around and hear me talk. And I know my voice can't hold up for that long. Uh, So next week we will probably be chopping 18 into pieces. So no need to panic or, you know, leave after lunch to escape that. Well, we have the meeting in Paris too. So uh, we probably won't have time to run four or five hours. But 1.30 to 5... I mean, we, we might be able to get in three, three and a half hours, and that'll give us plenty of time to drive down there. Anyway, all right, uh, y'all have a good week. Thank you very much. You are dismissed.